Luckily, this was a generally short module. We will need extra time to finish up on the list of antibiotic categories. The protein inhibitors are the largest and most diverse class and it requires a little extra time to cover them all. Up to this point, we've covered the basics of the beta-lactam and cell synthesis inhibitor antibiotic categories. If you haven't watched these past modules yet, you may want to catch up on those before continuing. The protein inhibitors are targeted at the ribosomes and enzymes within organism cells. Specifically, the 30S and 50S ribosomal subunits are major targets. The subunit size is correlated to the number of nucleotides of RNA. Tetracyclines and aminoglycosides target the 30S subunit. Macrolides, streptogramins, and chloramphenicol target the 50S subunit. Linezolid is a bit different in that it attacks both the 50 and 70S subunits. The tetracyclines all have the cyclin suffix, while the aminoglycosides mostly have the mycin suffix, with the exception of amikacin. Clindamycin also has the same suffix and a similar mechanism of action, but falls under the leucosinides drug class. It can be tricky to separate these at first, so pay special attention to the similarities now. As a general rule of thumb, any diseases caused by ticks gets treated with a tetracycline. Anaerobes can be treated with clindamycin, and specifically, the mnemonic often stated is above the diaphragm anaerobes, use clindamycin, below the diaphragm, use metronidazole. Linezolid and streptogramins are for vancomycin-resistant bugs, namely the enterococcus. For a typical pneumonia, macrolides are the first choice. Aminoglycosides, on the other hand, don't have a great generalization to follow, with the exception of streptomycin used in tuberculosis. Their effectiveness, growth of resistant strains, and amount of side effects don't make them the best option for most infections. You are more likely to see a test question on their side effects than as a first-line treatment. When these drugs make it to the bacterial cell, they are able to block the ribosomal manufacturing plants, stopping the creation of new proteins and enzymes. Without proteins, life as we know it could not exist. Similarly, the bacteria will not be able to continue their metabolic processes without certain proteins. Now that we have all the basics out of the way, there is relatively few specifics that we need to know for this module, as we only have two species of Neisseria to treat. Vaccinations against N. meningitidis has greatly decreased the prevalence of this infection in industrialized nations. However, there are still many that don't believe in the efficacy and safety of vaccines, and others that may have been vaccinated with older and less effective immune modulators. If a patient has meningitis plus a rash, that often separates this pathogen from other meningeal irritants. The first line of treatment is a cephalosporin, such as ceftriaxone or ceftaxone. Some recommendations state to add a steroid to this treatment to decrease the chance of neurologic damage. Close contacts, such as family members, should be prophylaxed with rifampin and ciprofloxacin. Rifampin is rarely used as a first line against any infections, except for the mycobacterium, such as tuberculosis. However, it is used as a prophylactic in several other infections for close contacts. And gonorrhea is traditionally treated with doxy. However, many experts do not recommend monotherapy for this pathogen due to its increased resistance to many drugs. And as doxycycline is a known teratogen, it should be avoided in pregnancy. Though doxy is still effective, the preferred single-dose treatment is a cephalosporin and a macrolide, such as azithromycin. This covers a co-infection with chlamydia, which is very common. Of course, the other place to see gonococcal infections is in the labor and delivery, or possibly the NICU. Gonococcal conjunctivitis is a severe neonatal infection of the eyes that can lead to blindness. The macrolide azithromycin is often used to treat all newborns, especially if their mother's infection history is unknown. Silver nitrate used to be the treatment of choice for gonococcal conjunctivitis, but has decreased in popularity as it may cause chemical conjunctivitis. We have covered the majority of common antibiotic classes at this point, and we'll save the anti-tuberculosis medications for that section. However, here's a brief chart of the most popular drugs in each category. It is not exhaustive, as there are always medications being created, tested out, and faded out. But this list has been relatively stable over the past several years. Feel free to screenshot it for studying or write them down in your notes. We will cover more specifics about each drug class, the drugs that fall under each class, and their side effects in a later module. If you are watching these videos through our online course, let us know what you think of the interactive videos. The quiz questions throughout are extra practice, which are not available for viewing on the YouTube channel videos. Also remember that our Mastery Paths program allows for different categories of achievement. 
as this was a short module, it may be a great opportunity to go back and gain mastery level in any of the subjects that may have been lacking previously. In the next module, we'll continue with another section on gram-negative bacteria. There are many of them in this classification, so they've been separated into different modules for easy chunking of material.